from being at Showtime, what did you learn about a flat script versus a viable script? To me, I'm looking for something. It's, it's pretty basic. It's does it grab me and does it keep me? Uh, it, it, however they accomplish that. Um, is it, um, does it flow? Does it have a, a natural flow? Does it make me want to turn the pages? Um, in my training, I learned somewhat how to do that. And then in subsequent experience and study, and we, we talk about it in the books, um, the, the techniques that you can actually do, there are tools you can use to keep the audience engaged. Um, but essentially that was it. I wasn't looking, or, nor was I instructed to look for any particular type of material. I was just handed things. Um, and some of the things I did were reading stage plays. Like, can we make this into a Showtime on Broadway production? Would that work? Um, sometimes they'd send me off to see a, a theater group, um, that kind of thing. And I'd have to give a report on my judgment on that. Um, but beyond something that grabs you and keeps your attention, um, I'm not, uh, that, that's pretty much it. Now there was one script and, I, and I, I'll have to, it'll have to be, remain nameless. There was one script that I remember uh, from that time, a couple of years that I was doing that. And I thought, this is funny, this is smart, this is clever. And I thought, I sure hope this gets made somehow. And that was like 1983, okay, 84. And uh, time went on and then sure enough, it got made uh, 20 years later. And I thought, oh, that's great. Same title, but by then it had been so rewritten that it was a famous disaster. <laughs> and it was too bad, but that would be an example. There was one that just, the cleverness of the writing, the, um, the, the way the characters were so sharp, the way it flowed was, uh, made me remember it. Um, it stood out in, in the pile of material. So. Interesting. Why do you think so many, whether it's hands got, you know, in the pie, or why do you think that it had such a fresh voice and then it was almost, this is just my word, but destroyed? Well, <laughs> <laughs> Maybe well, that's too strong, but. Well, and it's not too strong. Um, it's the mode of production, I think, in, at least for big movies, is, is uh, a, a problem, I think, because. When you have a big movie, and this wound up being a big studio movie, I just think there's so much pressure that it work, that there's defensive things that happen, and we need to make sure that, the, okay, I'm not sure this draft is right, let's get another writer in, and then, you know, there's, uh, there's so much at stake that it, it has an effect on, on the product, and it can become incoherent. And it is a collaborative medium, and there's always gonna be even in the best of circumstances, you, you could have a, a great writer, director, producer, cast, and, and script, and it could still fall flat. It, it's imprecise. But there seems to be, a, the storytelling tends to flatten out in these situations because one of the elements of, uh, that I talk about more in the first book about dramatic irony, dramatic irony is, of course, Alfred Hitchcock used it to create suspense. To create, to, use, to create a story that involves withholding some information from the audience, some information from the characters uh, when you reveal it, that requires someone who's really watching it and imagining it in their own mind the whole time. And if you've got a lot of people involved, somebody's going to go, oh my goodness, uh, are we sure the audience is going to get this? Well, you better make it clear. And if it's clear, it risks being boring. Um, the three, three, three questions that Frank Danielle shared with us that I, I still think apply uh, to any story. He said there's three questions that you ask when you're crafting a story. Um, one, what does the main character want and what are they trying to avoid? Okay, that's question one. Two, what does the main character know and what does the main character not know? And then the third question is what does the audience know, what does the audience not know? And I don't think most writers realize that you have control over those second two. That the audience, especially when I work with students, the audience doesn't have to know everything all the time. And the characters don't have to know everything all the time. You can withhold some information. You can 
play games. In fact, um, my takeaway from uh, the book that Connie and I did, The, the Science of Screenwriting, yeah, see it. Uh, that came out last year, okay. was this applying constructivist psychology to the storytelling process. Um, this is something that was uh, in the 80s, uh, uh, film critic David Bordwell came out with a blockbuster uh, scholarly work in which he squarely placed storytelling uh, in the realm of the constructivist psychology. And that simply means that most of our experience in life, most of our experience of reality, is based not on knowledge, but on inferences that we make based on clues. So that you uh, have uh, what's called uh, top-down processing. Bottom-up processing is you see things, it goes into your brain and you make note of it and you store information. Top-down is you see something in the world and your brain automatically compares what you've experienced before with what you're seeing and then you make a conclusion. There's shortcuts that we're doing all the time. You've never seen the back of this chair, but you've seen chairs, so you assume the back kind of looks like any other chair. It would be a surprise twist if the back of this chair had a, a, a dragon hiding out there, you know, because that's not normal, uh, what you're normally associating with that concept. Um, so in, um, when you're telling a story, you're, you, you, if you understand that that's how audiences are responding, that how they, how they experience a movie is they're looking for clues and they're going to put them together and they're actively involved in constructing a reality. You're the one, as a screenwriter, as a storyteller, you're giving them the clues. You're turning them, again in Frank Danielle's term, you're making them the smartest people in the world. You're making them so brilliant because they're seeing all these clues and you're the one who's actually giving them to them. But they think they're figuring it out and they're gonna to try to anticipate where you're going because they've seen movies before. Uh, this is a, a notion, a conceptual framework called a schema. They've seen a movie. They know how movies are. They know they have, tend to have a character who does this and that. And when you know that, you can play games with them. And that's, the, for me, the most fun thing about screenwriting is creating worlds and driving people crazy, getting in their heads. And you can learn how to get in their heads. Um, I'll, I'll, just a very simple example. Suppose I show you a movie, there's a shot of a husband and he's buying wife and his wife uh, uh, flowers and chocolate and an anniversary card, okay? Uh, and uh, on his way home from work, okay? Then, meanwhile, you see the wife has got a gun and she's hiding it in the bedroom drawer, okay? What are you gonna think? Well, it's pretty obvious, isn't it? He he's wants to make love and she has other plans, right? Okay. Um, that's where the audience is going to go. And that's, you could pay it off that he comes home with the flowers, she pulls out the gun and shoots him. Or you could then disclose later that the gun, that he's a gun collector and, the surprise, and this is a, a present for him. This is a gun he's been looking for. She saved up for it and she wants to give it to him uh, for an anniversary present. And then you find out that he poisoned the chocolate. <laughs> So you, we just told, a twist is just telling <laughs> um, two stories at the same time, the one the audience thinks it's seeing and the one it's actually seeing. And you're relying, when you do that kind of thing, on the audience's propensity to figure it out and be smarter than you. And once you've got them going that way, you can have all kinds of fun. So that, that's one element of the constructivist psychology that, that we mention in the um, book and have examples of of the filmmakers doing that, you know, doing that kind of thing.